chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Things are not always as they appear to be. This is true in the scriptures, and it's true in our lives also. It's easy to get fooled by an illusion. I remember a few years ago when we were on vacation, one of my children ordered pancakes and thought that the white side to it was whipped cream, and so just covered the pancakes in whipped cream, but turned out to be butter, and just loaded this thing up, and then took the first bite and was shocked to see that it wasn't what he thought it was. Um, Things are not always as they appear to be, and we are looking at part two today of the section that started last week in verse 32. We looked at this together last week. We saw the scene that unfolds in verse 32 in the book of Acts, which is the story of the early church and God's movement on the, in the early church. And we saw the glory of the generous church last Sunday. We saw people selling land and houses and assets to raise money for the church and to meet the needs of the body and that the preaching of the gospel would go forward. It's this glorious picture of the I- ideal church. We saw last week they were giving joyfully and sacrificially. They were giving under compulsion. No one made them do this. It was flowing from grace that they had received in the gospel. It flowed from their common mission together for the sake of Christ. It flowed from the example of those around them who were generous in Christ. If you have tasted the generosity of God to you in the gospel, it reorients you from a from a taker to become a giver. That's what the gospel's power does in your life. It's actually a sign that you're becoming more like Jesus. You find your joy increasingly in giving rather than in taking. That's what Jesus did for us. Jesus said, we said last week, 2 Corinthians 8, Jesus who was rich for our sakes became poor So that through his poverty, even to death on a cross, we would inherit the riches of Christ. So the gospel reorients our whole sense of economy. Which means that if you're a believer today in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for your sins, then what you possess and what you will lay full claim to someday the inheritance that has been promised us in Christ, what you possess is so ridiculously lavish. What you own in Christ is so ridiculously lavish that the word chosen to describe it as we read in Ephesians 2, verse 7, is immeasurable. The immeasurable riches of Christ is yours. So you are rich as a believer, and that makes for a generous church. And that's where we saw last week, but things are not always as they appear to be. And we see today in scene two, the first crack in the glory of the ideal church. Scene two is a contrast with the passage from last week between the beautiful ideal of the generous church and the messy reality of the still sinful church between the generosity that the gospel produces and the ungodliness of greed and of deception. It's a contrast between the favor of God among his people as they are unified together with one heart and one mind and one soul and the judgment of God against the sins of his people in a temporal sense. There's actually no story quite like this in all the scriptures. There's a couple that come close. The story of Achan story of Herod, but there's no story that's like this exactly. This is unique. As many stories in the book of Acts are, they, they are, they're here to teach us something about God and about us. John Stott, speaking on this passage, once remarked that the church was not all romance and righteousness. Maybe that's been your experience as well. Church is not all romance and righteousness. There is, a, there is a beautiful ideal and a vision of what the church ought to be, and then there is the messiness of what the church is because of our sin. 
And so we should come to this passage with caution. Because we're going to see today that the holy God of the scriptures will have his glory, whether it be through judgment or whether it be through salvation or whether it be through blessing or whether it be through discipline, the holy God of the scriptures will have his glory in your life one way or another. And God is not any less interested in your holiness and in your purity and the holiness and purity of his people today than he was on the day that the mountain thundered in Exodus 20 when he gave the law. And so we read with caution. Don't say I didn't warn you. We're going to read starting back in verse 32 of chapter 4. From last week. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said they had any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Well, Lord, we need to pray as we've read this word because it has sobered us quickly. And we pray that as we study this passage, you would purify us as your church. That the right view of your holiness would Bring us to our knees for the mercy that we have found in Christ. Lord, help us today to see you as you are and to see ourselves as we are and to not play games. That we might walk in a manner worthy of the gospel to which we have been called. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what's your response to this passage? Mine is something like this. Whoa. What just happened? You know, for, we were talking about Thanksgiving and we were playing turkey bowl and throwing the football around and we got Christmas decorations up and we're singing the Christ has come, hallelujah. And then this, this is shocking. Even as I'm reading the passage, I can kind of feel you know, the air being sucked out of the room a little bit. Well, what did happen? Well, let's look at what happened. Ananias and Sapphira, part of what can be assumed to be the church, schemed together 
lied to the apostles and sinned against God. Ananias first, then Sapphira second, but they did it in conjunction with each other. Ananias, as he sins, falls over dead in what can only be described as an act of divine judgment. Sapphira then comes in and she's tested and she affirms the lie as well. She falls over dead too. This is not a coincidence. This is not an accident. One commentator described it as a a judgment miracle. Another person wrote that it's a sanctifying discipline for the church. However you want to call it, this is severe judgment. Now, these two passages from last week and this week, they go together because verse 1 of chapter 5 begins with the word but. So you can see the contrast. The the united church, one heart, one mind, one soul, generous, selling things, giving away their possessions, and even to the point where Joseph, who's a son of encouragement, sells his field and, and gives the money to the apostles. And then you have this passage here. They're meant to go together. They're meant to tie together. They're meant to help contrast the beautiful ideal and the messy reality. Now, I've been sitting in this passage for two weeks and thinking on this, you know, wishing that in some ways that this didn't fall on the Sunday after Thanksgiving. And, um, but we preach the Bible, and, and so here we are in Acts, and we find this passage, and it's a very difficult passage to preach for lots of reasons. One of the reasons is that we just, we just don't know a whole lot about what's happening here. There's just a lot of things we don't know. How much money did they keep back? You know, did they sell it for $200,000 and then they kept back 1000 and they gave away 199 Did they sell it for 200000 and they kept back 180 and they gave twenty? We don't know. Was this the first time they've schemed this way or had it happened before? Was this a pattern in their lives where Ananias and Sapphira were kind of work in the system. We don't know. How does Peter know that they're lying? We don't know. I mean, apart from just the revelation of God through the Spirit to him. But what makes this passage most difficult is is not even the unknown questions. It's what is known, and that's that this is a, a very severe judgment. And there's really nothing I can do to make that go down smoothly other than altering the text, which we're not going to do. And so we must look at the scriptures and believe that they are here. This story, like every other story, is here for a purpose. It's, it's for a reason. It's to benefit the church. I believe it's put here for many reasons, one of which is to put a holy fear in us of, of God and his holiness, even as his people redeemed by grace. It's to sober us to, towards the God that we follow, that he is real and that he is holy. After all, that is the effect it had on the early church. We read twice in the text, and great fear came upon the whole church. That's the way the passage closes. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Fear, reverence, awe, and and, and, and a desire to not sin came upon this church and everyone who heard. So not every story in the Bible is meant to give you warm fuzzies. And not every story in the Bible is here you know, to, just, to just make you walk out on a, on a cloud. Sometimes we must be warned, as John Stott said. The church is not always romance and righteousness. So we're going to ask three questions of this passage to help us feel the appropriate weight that we are expected to feel as we read it about our sin and about God's judgments and about God's mercy. Give you them up front. First, what was their sin? What was their sin? Secondly, why did they sin? And third, why were the consequences so severe? What was their sin? Why did they sin? Why were the consequences so severe? First, what was their sin? For the first week or so, as I thought in this passage, I was thinking that it was 
a mixture of things, but, but that greed was a part of their sin, of sins. You know, that they sold property and they didn't want to give all the money away because they wanted some for themselves kind of sounds a little bit like greed. They were greedy. They wanted to keep some from themselves. Now, greed, greed masquerades as a virtue. Have you ever noticed that? Greed, 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 <laughs> greed pretends to be a virtue. It says, is it wrong for me to do this? Is it wrong for me to keep back the proceeds, you know, to, to help my, my wife and my, my family? Wrong. And so greed makes a man work 14 to 16 hours a day just driven after money. Greed masquerades as a virtue. But in truth, greed is an ugly sin. Greed is actually the opposite of the Christ life. It reverts back to a, a selfish taking instead of a generous giving. Greed distorts the beauty of the gospel and turns it into a dark and colorless image. Well, this might have driven their decision, but we really don't know. We don't know if, if, if the reason why they kept the money back was because that they had, maybe they had a nephew who was sick and they were going to pay for his hospital bills. We don't know. We don't know why they kept the money back. But here's what we do know. That for whatever reason that they kept this money, legitimate or illegitimate, they wanted credits for giving the whole thing. They wanted to appear to be even more generous than they were. They wanted to look spiritually impressive. They wanted human praise instead of wanting God's praise. So we can see here at the base that there is this pride. There is this desire for praise from man. Now what do you think Ananias was hoping to have happen here? Here's, here's, here's what I think he was hoping to have happen. He was hoping to be recognized among the church like Joseph, the son of encouragement known as Barnabas. See, I think that's one of the reasons why Joseph's example is used in the passage from last week. It's to help contrast. Here's Joseph. He goes and sells a field. He brings it at the apostles' feet. He's a generous giver. And then there's Ananias and Sapphira, and they want to be known as this generous giver too among the church. So I think that what he's hoping happens is that he and Sapphira, they will become heroes in the church. Whoa, Ananias, you, you didn't just give some of the money. You gave all of the money. I mean, I thought you were generous before, but now look at you. I mean, I thought Barnabas was generous, but you, Ananias and Sapphira, you are so generous. Now, they could have actually been that, but they didn't want to give all the money away. They only wanted it to appear as if they gave all the money away in order to look good with the church. Kent Hughes, in his commentary, wrote, this was pious pretense, religious sham, simulated holiness, Christian fraught. Now, is this hard to imagine happening? Not at all. It's not at all hard to imagine exaggerating something for a greater effect positioning yourself in a way to make yourself look better than you are. I've done these things many times. Now here's a, ch here's a challenging thought. They were struck down for their sins after they gave a bunch of money to the church. So imagine how confusing this might have been to those watching, right? Right? You're bringing in your bucket of cash, overflowing with bills, and you place it at the feet of the apostles. You know, you turn around and you're like, yeah. And then you fall over dead. I mean, most people would expect to be applauded for that, rewarded, promoted. Most people would assume that if they sold their house for $200,000 and they gave 100000 of it to the church, that there would be the sense of esteem and of reward. 
So if this stretches your understanding, think about how it must have felt to Ananias. Again, Pastor Hughes wrote the confusion that he imagined happening in Ananias' mind, and I liked it, so I'm going to quote it here. He says, picture the scene. Ananias has just finished laying his gift at Peter's feet, and the organ is finished playing, I surrender all. Ananias' heart begins to thump. He feels dizzy and confused. Why isn't Peter smiling at him? Instead of recognizing Ananias' generosity, Peter rebukes him for spiritual deception. Here it is that we find out what the sin really is. We see it clearly. It wasn't that they gave too little. It wasn't that they didn't, you know, they didn't get the thermometer up to the full amount. Verse 3 says, Peter, as he's rebuking them, says, While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? His point is that their property, their, their possessions, remained under their control, their decisions. They were under no obligation to sell their property. It was at their discretion whether they should sell at all or whether they should give the money at all. It was theirs to do what they saw fit. It was not mandated by the apostles. So it wasn't that they gave too little. There was no, there was no minimum amount. And it wasn't that they didn't give at all. Verse 3, and after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? They, they were not obligated to give any part of the money. They could have sold the house and kept all the money for themselves to do with it whatever they felt they needed to do in God's mission, and they would not have been sinning. So just, just to clarify that, there, the example of the church, which was, was giving out of faith and joy and gratitude and mission. It was spirit-inspired giving, the way that we want to give at Grace Church. So the point here is, is, is that it wasn't that they keep back part of the... Is this thing off or is it on? Is it going in and out? You guys here okay? Good. Okay, well, I'll press forward until I need to change. The problem wasn't that they, had, that they kept back part of the proceeds. It's that they decided to represent this part of it as the whole. They were deceiving the apostles. It's a, a d- spiritual deception. It's a double life. You come off to the church as one way, and then you live a double life. It's spiritual deception. When you say you're going to pray for people, but then you never do, it's spiritual deception. When you tell your accountability friends that you're staying pure with your fiancé, but then you're not, it's spiritual deception. When you act like you've really invested financially in the mission of the church and you're behind what the church is doing, but you really haven't, it's, it's spiritual deception. When you quote scripture to make people think you've been diligently studying the word, but you haven't, it's spiritual deception. When you come to community group and you share and you pretend like nothing's wrong in your life, but inside you are dying, it is spiritual deception. That is the issue that is at stake. So that is the sin. Second question is, why? Why did they do this? Why did they do this? Why didn't they just represent it the way that, they, that, that was truthful? Well, two reasons that were given in this text Peter asks the same question of Ananias. Why? And then in the same breath, he answers the question. So look with me in verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why? Has Satan filled your heart? (coughs) Excuse me, now it works, right? Why can't it cut out then? Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. Why? Why has Satan done this? This is a crucial time in the history of the church. God is on the move. The church is is growing. The gospel is advancing. There is harmony. There is peace. There is generosity. There is sacrifice. Why? As God fills his church with his spirit, At Pentecost, Acts 2, that's one of the defining moments of the church, filled with the Spirit. Peter says here that Satan has filled their hearts. What a contrast. And this is why I take Ananias and Sapphira to be believers, even though that's not 100% clear from this passage. 
But I take them to be believers because it says in this verse that he has lied to the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 4, it says that he lied not to man, but to God. And then to, in Sapphira's case, that she has lied to the Spirit of God. So I believe that they are believers, converted, but they are walking in spiritual deception. And here we see one of the reasons why is because of Satan's influence in their life. Now, don't think about Satan as a red devil cartoonish figure with a pitchfork. Don't think about Satan this way. You will never think rightly about him this way. Much more serious and much more destructive than that. And don't think about Satan only as influencing people who are committed to the occult or witchcraft or satanic, explicit satanic sacrifices or those kinds of things. He's much too subtle for that. We must avoid either error because in this text we can see that though a Christian well, we see from other texts that though a Christian cannot be possessed by Satan, where the Spirit of God cannot dwell in the same spot as Satan in a, as a demonic presence, though that is true, Satan still has the ability to influence our decisions by influencing the desires of our hearts. That's why we are warned. That's why Paul warns the church of believers, and Peter warns the church in Ephesians 6.12 and 1 Peter 5.8. Read it very quickly. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, written to the church. 1 Peter 5.8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is how Satan works. See, think, about, think about Satan's slimy words to Eve in the garden. He says, surely you will not die. Did God really say that? No, that's not true. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Translation, the temptation is, God is lying to you. God doesn't want you to be as happy as you could possibly be when he tells you not to do that. If you want to be happy, then you should ignore what God's word says and you should do what you want to do. If God loved you, he would let you eat of every tree. These are the lies. Was it cutting out? What's well, a good stopping point? How's that? Is that better? In a room this big, I could probably just shout and it would be fine. You know, I think that Satan is so subtle in the way that he tempts us. If you give all that money away and don't say it was everything that you got from the sale, people might think you're greedy and not as godly. You don't really want that. So just tell them that it was everything. No one will know the difference. Besides, that's a ton of money. They should just be happy with that. Satan tempts. Satan tempted Ananias. Satan tempts us in similar ways. And yet... The responsibility for our decisions to sin is still ours. Peter goes on to say that it's not just Satan who's at work, but Ananias' sin that's at work too. So later on, down the, down the passage, it says in verse 4, why is it that you, Ananias, have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. See, Satan doesn't make us do what we don't already want to do in our hearts. We sin because we have sinful desires in our hearts. We want what we cannot have. Satan might come along and amplify that de desire and might help accelerate that desire, but we want what we cannot have. They wanted to be thought of as great 
sacrificial servants, and they did not fear God, but they feared losing the praise of men. And the desire is so strong that Ananias not only comes up with this plan, but talks his wife into it too. Truthfully, do you think they expected this result? No. Why would they have risked their lives for this? They probably never expected to get caught, and they certainly didn't expect to have to give up their lives for it. Which brings us to the third question. Why such a severe consequence? Why such a severe consequence? That that might be a question you're asking. Certainly is a question I asked throughout the last couple weeks. Why such a severe consequence for something that seems to be such a relatively minor offense? I mean, there are other people who sin in the Bible who who sin maybe even in greater ways and don't receive this kind of judgment against them. I mean, the dude gave money, right? So that has to count for something. This doesn't seem fair, you might think. Why such a severe response? Well, here's the only appropriate answer, and listen carefully. Our God is to be revered. Our God is to be revered. He is not a trinket to be trifled with. He is not an old man on his rocking chair, unable to get up and do something about the neighbor's kids who kick the ball into his yard. He is the soul breather, the molecule maker. He is the oxygen creator, the star flinger. He is the one who holds everything together right now by a single word off of his tongue. He is the Lord. He is the king. He is the righteous. And the essence of what it means to be a Christian is found in the recognition of Jesus as this righteous king, the Lord who came to earth and took upon himself the judgment for our sins. We rehearse this gospel each week that Jesus was mercilessly whipped and flogged and beaten until he was hardly recognizable, Isaiah says and prophesies. And then they drove nails through the bones in his hands and in his ankles so that he would be affixed upon a cross where he would bleed to death and And he would die from asphyxiation in full view of the public. And all of this he willingly chose to bear in order that we might not experience the horrific pain of God's wrath against our sins. And so Jesus choked down every drop of God's wrath that the Father had stored up. So the scriptures say he might be the just and the justifier of the ungodly. The cross doesn't first tell us that we are forgiven. The cross first tells us that we deserve hell for our sins and that Jesus endured that hell on the cross for us. Which means, church, that every sinful plan and every sinful response as a Christian, is now done in full view of this cross. We see many glimpses of Ananias and Sapphira in our own hearts. If we could only get a a, a sense of how, how holy God actually is and how wicked our sinful wayward hearts are, often go, we would actually not be shocked by God's response in this passage. It wouldn't seem severe to us at all. It would seem appropriate. We wouldn't ask such questions like, why is this so severe? We would ask questions like, why not me? Why has God not dealt with me in the same way that he deals with Ananias and with Sapphira? Dr. Barnhouse once wrote this. He said, if God acted in the same way today that he did in the fifth chapter of Acts, you'd have to have a morgue in the basement of every church and a mortician on the pastoral staff. Not, not why so severe, 
It's why not so severe to me? In his good purposes for the good of the church at this point in time, God wanted to sober the believers and remind them again that he alone is God. And that sin, premeditated sin, though paid for at the cross for Christians, no condemnation and fear of eternal judgment for our sins, though that is true, sin is grossly out of place in the life of the church. And so one of the intended effects of this passage is that we, the church, would be sobered to walk with a greater reverence for God's holiness. It says, great fear came upon the whole church. There's a sense of reverence that the holiness of God, his presence is with his people and that he's not to be trifled with. That should be our response this morning as well. And so I'm asking you to, 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 to consider this seriously. Take, take your spiritual pulse this morning. Are you who you say you are? Are you who you say you are to the people around you? Is that who you really are? Is there sin that you've kept hidden from everybody else? Are you living your life one way on Sunday and at community group or the events of the church, but then you live your life in a totally different way the rest of the week? Do you, do you have a double identity? Do you, are you someone completely different with one group of friends to another group of friends? Is your focus on the things of this world, the money, your, your, your family, your job, your, life, your, your, your hobbies and whatnot, and not focused and centered on, on God? Are you simply going through the motions of your faith? Do you just show up to church and to events, but just, you know, go through the motions? You're not really engaging but you're putting off airs that you are? Are you secretly neglecting your relationship with God and then pretending like everything is all right? See, this passage is here to warn us and and move us in a direction. God, God knows everything. God sees everything. God sees all. He knows all. He wants you to change, and he's given you his spirit to do that. He wants you to Walk consistently with him. He wants you to re-examine your priorities and put him on the center, in the center of your life. He is on the move, and he wants to be on the move in your life if you will confess your sin to him and repent from the way you've been living and begin walking again as a follower of Christ. It's one of the intended effects of this passage. Don't let this sermon go and this Sunday go without wrestling with this. But there's one other effect that this passage should have on us, and I want us to close on this note because this is one of those really heavy sermons. In light of everything we've read, who God is, who we are, we should should tremble in our seats. But even here in Acts chapter 5, even in the strongest scene of judgment in the pages of the Scriptures, we see God's mercy peek its head out from among the clouds. For, for while God is perfectly righteous and just to bring the experiment of Ananias and Sapphira and you and me to a sudden stop whenever he pleases, even though he's perfectly righteous and just to do that, listen, God's mercy is his most common expression to his church. And I want to draw your attention to something that doesn't jump out of the text, but it's there. Of every sinner listed in Acts 5, only two face this kind of swift judgment for their sins, even though they're not the worst sins that could be committed in comparison to other sins in the Bible that didn't receive the same kind of judgment. Only two, and the rest lived. God showed mercy to the rest of the church you know, the ones who were in great fear over all that had happened. God showed mercy to the rest of the church in spite of their many sins to think about their lives in light of God and to walk in a manner worthy of this gospel. Yes, fear came upon them all, but they were that who were alive to stand in fear were experiencing the mercy of God, the active, present mercy of God. How kind of God to treat any sinner with mercy. 
How kind of God to treat me with mercy. A a sinner filled with Ananias and Sapphira-like tendencies. How kind of God to keep us here in his mercy. So, Christian, you sit here in light of God's holiness. It should drive you to your knees in praise for the mercy we find in the gospel. It should cause a reverent fear in the way you live your life, and it should drive you to your knees for the mercy that we commonly experience in the gospel. This story is unique. God's purpose in Ananias and Sapphira is not to ultimately make you think that he's going to kill you for every one of your sins. It's unique. It's to sober the church at this point in time in history. It doesn't happen again the same way because God is merciful to his church. And so be sobered and be grateful. Be sobered and be grateful. Be holy and be filled with praise. The justice of God and the mercy of God. Let's pray. God, I want to begin even before communion is taken by just praising you because I confess that I am Ananias and Sapphira. Though I have not sold property and kept some of it back, there are so many ways, small, subtle, exaggerations, overstatements, desire to be thought of as higher than I am, ways in which I give in to the same temptations as as they did. I believe, Lord, that you are showing me a better way and showing me mercy to walk in that way. And so I praise you, Lord. Pray you would have your way with us, that we would kneel in the dust at the foot of the cross and praise you for your mercy. Christ's name. Amen.